So if we, if we know the answer to that, then God will have his proper primary place in our lives. And we will love him, serve him, honor and obey him. Amen. And we won't be careless about Christ. So many Christians, nominal Christians as we call them, who, who go to church sometimes every week, sometimes once a month, sometimes once a year, twice a year, if you include Easter. So many times there's this, this kind of vagueness about Christ, but friend, and they're careless about him. If they knew who he was, they would be in church and enjoying Jesus. Amen. Not just enduring church. Amen. My, my wife... Incidentally, let's welcome our live stream right now. Uh, my wife is watching. Hi, Julie. And uh, I, I don't know why you chose that song about the highlands and the heartache. I've been to the highlands and I have heartache because I'm missing you. And uh, uh, hello to Margaret, Julie's mother there, and everybody else on the live stream. And uh, Julie was telling me that they went to an Anglican church this morning in this little village that they live in called Cockatoo. <laughs> that's how the Australians pronounce it, Cockatoo. And uh, St. Luke's Church, it's an Anglican church in Australia, and it's a Holy Ghost church. It's a church where God shows up, amen. And uh, they know who Jesus is. And uh, every true Christian will know who Jesus is. But so many, so many nominal Christians need the revelation that Jesus is God, that that was God in the flesh. Are you with me? So, when we get that heart revelation and we get beyond just mental assent to the doctrine of the divinity of Christ, that will impact our lives and see us order our lives around him rather than somehow putting, or ordering Jesus around our lives. We order our lives around him and there's a huge difference, isn't there? And that way we can receive this abundant life that Christ promised us, this abundant life. A life that will glorify God, a life that's enjoyable, not without trials, sometimes severe trials, but with the trials, we know he is with us all the way, and that every trial works out for a greater degree of glory in us. Amen? And we become, we always become better if we don't become bitter. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we go through the, we go through excruciating trials as Christians, uh, whether that's overt uh, persecution such as our our Persian brothers receive in Iran, or, or whether it's, it's just difficult, difficult times. So the, the, the disciples that we've seen in the boat with Jesus, they had already decided to follow him. And somehow they had this vague idea that, that, that yes, this man is the Messiah, the long-promised deliverer of Israel. But even, the, even Israel, even the Jewish people, they didn't quite have a handle on who the Messiah was going to be, of course, but they, they, and what he was going to do. They expected this national deliverer to rid them of the Roman rule, but they didn't reckon on this God-man, this person we call Jesus this person that came down and was born in a little baby and, and lived a sinless life and then somehow ended up dying on a cross for the sins of the whole world. And then miracle of miracles, he's raised from the dead to show that he's got the power over even death, not just the wind and the waves, but over death itself. And then he makes a promise that if we believe in him and trust in him, that even if we should die, we'll live forever with him in heaven. They, they, they just didn't reckon on that. The Old Testament only gave, a, it only gave an inkling of who the Messiah was. But nonetheless, they're following him. Some had followed John the Baptist, and John the Baptist had pointed them to Jesus. And now they're following Jesus, but they really didn't have a clue, uh, too much of a clue, as to who he was. It was going to take a revelation, an illumination by the Holy Spirit, for them to, to finally dawn on them, who is this they're dealing with? Exactly what kind of man is this? You remember when Peter answered a question that Jesus posed there? And Jesus had asked the disciples, he says, well, who, who do men, who do the crowd say that I am? And, and they, they said, well, Elijah or, or one of the prophets. But he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, wow. He says, well, flesh and blood, people teachers. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, Peter, but my Father who's in heaven has revealed that to you. And what a difference that would have made to Peter's walk with God, the sudden revelation that who he has before him is the Christ. 
He is the Son of God. Wow. And I, the reason I'm sharing this, because I was kind of, I was kind of reflecting when I was away uh, up in the mountains there. I, I was reflecting on that, that revelation of who Christ is and the impact it can make in your life. And I remember when I first became a Christian 30, 31 years ago. Um, actually, it's longer than that. 36 years ago, I became a Christian. And I was, a, as many of you know, I was an out-and-out -out heathen before that, an absolute pagan. Uh, but then... Some of the beliefs of my grandma and grandpa and my mother, they began, I began to consider those beliefs again. I grew up in a Christian home. And sooner or later, after one more mountaineering trip, which I nearly died uh, several times, uh, I came back and I really began to reflect. When you've had a few, close, a few close calls with death, be it doing crazy things like I have or, or you know, whatever, road accidents or overdoses, uh, you begin to think about, Eternity. You begin to think about what's beyond death's door. And I, and anyway, to cut a long story short, once I got married, uh, Julie and I both became Christians at the same time. And with my head, I believed what my grandma taught and I believed what my mother taught, that, that Jesus is God. And in and, and the back of my mind, I was just glad I was forgiven <laughs> for all the terrible things I'd done. I was glad I could leave my shame behind, all the stuff I'd done, the shame, all of that stuff I'd done in the dark. I was glad that Jesus had forgiven me. He'd put my past behind me, and I was starting a brand new life with a new heart, a new me. I was so grateful for that. But you see, in my head, I kind of theologically, I, 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 with the intellect, I subscribed to the belief that Jesus was God. But then one day, I was studying my Bible, and I read Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And this is a prophecy given 600 years before Jesus was ever born. And uh, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. So it's talking about... Jesus coming into the earth. And he says, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. We see that in Christmas cards, at least religious ones, every, every Christmas, don't we? To, for us a child is born, to us a son is given. And this government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, this is, this is where my attention was focused. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. But look at the next one. Mighty God. Mighty God. I, I stopped right there. I thought, this little baby, this child that is born, this son that's been given that we celebrate every Christmas, he's mighty God. He's mighty God. Boy, I just stopped. I, I kind of thought, what? And yet my head knew that. I, my head knew the doctrine of the divinity of Christ. But when I read these words of Isaiah, the 600-year-old prophecy, that he was going to be called mighty God, wow, that went beyond the intellect. It was a heart revelation for me. And it changed my world. It, it changed my world. It changed my reverence for Christ. It, it changed in degrees my, my obedience, especially my honor and respect of him. Do you hear what I'm saying? And this is what I mean. This is a very practical teaching because if you accurately know who Jesus Christ is, you, you can begin to order your life properly. You begin to put first things first. You begin to live a life that is based on purpose and meaning. Amen. As well as knowing that you've got a place in heaven when you die. But there's an abundant life to be lived in this life. Are you with me? So my, my hope and prayer is that as we go through these passages, there's only three, uh, lovely, there's more than three, but I'm going to share and unpack three passages. So my hope and prayer for you guys this morning is, is like me, that it will become a heart revelation if it hasn't already. And I've, I've been studying for hours this week, uh, out of a sheer love for it, uh, studying uh, the book of John, the gospel of John, and, and these commentaries that I have. And uh, they, they, are, they have introductions like 50 pages just to the book itself. And they speak about Christ and the logos of God and all of that. And I've been so blessed this last week at studying the deity of Christ, who the word was made flesh. Amen. Are you with me? So let's unpack a few potentially illuminating passages of Scripture. So let's go 
to the go-to passage, John chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3, and then verse 14. Okay, just to stay on track, um, I have a tendency to go off in tangents, so I've kind of cut out uh, from verse 3 to verse 14, just to stay focused on this person described as the Word, a capital W. One of the names of Christ is the Word. So let's look at this. It starts the same way as the book of Genesis, in the beginning. Here it starts the same, in the beginning. But here it goes even further back, and it talks about before all time. In the beginning, before all time was the Word. And the Amplified Bible there, Christ. So you might say, you mean this Christ that walked to the earth 2,020 years ago? You mean that same Christ existed with God even before the beginning of creation. Yes. Yes. And if you can get your head around that, you'll realize you're dealing with more than just a human being. You're dealing with someone who is divine. Amen. So in the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God. Okay, so God the Father. The Word... This name for Jesus, this name for Christ, was with God, and the Word was God Himself. You cannot get it any clearer than that. That this person called the Word, and I'll explain why he called that in a minute, but here we read that He was God Himself, and still is, by the way. Are you with me? Verse 2, He was present originally with God, Look at verse 3. What kind of man is this? All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him was not even one thing made that has come into being. Wow! So, in creation, he was instrumental in all that was made. Through him, everything was made, including, as you'll see, us. And then look at verse 14. And this is the, this is the wonder of it all, friends. This is the wonder of it all. This, this is the one that ought to floor us every time we read it. And the word, that son of God, that, that one through, that created everything. And the word became flesh. Right? That's a good time to give a clap. That's a good time to say, thank you, Father God. That's a good time to be grateful. And the Word became flesh. How incredible that this person, the second person of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. How incredible that that second person of the Godhead is born a 23-inch baby. Wow! Wow! Unto us a son is born, and his name is going to be called Mighty God. Oh, what kind of man is this? <laughs> it's already starting to boggle your mind. Every time I cover this stuff, I, I just get so blessed. Amen. And he, of course, he grows up. 30 years, enters into ministry. The Holy Spirit comes on him at his baptism. From that point on, he's... Stilling the storm, raising the dead, opening blind eyes, turning water into wine, multiplying loaves and fishes to feed multitudes. Wow. Next week, by the way, we're going to be dealing with five blocks of evidence from the Word of God. And and indeed, from beyond the Word of God, because there are many other writings outside the Bible that speak of Jesus. He's a real... People that say he wasn't a historical figure just don't know what they're talking about. There are plenty ancient sources that mention Christ and his supernatural ability. They just attribute it to the devil or something dark and not to God. But he's recorded there in extra biblical sources. Are you with me? So let's, let's have a look at this. This word became flesh, human, incarnate, and he tabernacled. He fixed his tent of flesh, his human flesh, and he lived a while among us. 
33 years. And we actually saw his glory. This is John, one of the disciples. And he's, he's, you can tell his mind is just boggled. He says, man. He, and and he's, in his letter, we saw him. We touched him. We felt him. <laughs> Amen. John's thinking, goodness gracious, I even, you know, John, the, the apostle, he says that he leaned on Jesus' breast there at the Last Supper. Wow. Could you imagine how he felt after Christ was resurrected and he realized, I was leaning on the breast of the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead. Woohoo! <laughs> friend, Christianity is just so incredible. We, we, had a, we had a number of uh, people from uh, Persia, from Iran, uh, on Wednesday. And there was a couple of new faces there. And uh, they're still Muslims. And, um, but he's interested in Christianity. And, we, and we'd had no interpreter. But man, we tried to unpack the Trinity. <laughs> and Islam, well, Islam, like so many, so many other religions, believe God is one and he has no son. But we believe God is, is one, but he's also three person, and he has a son. And there is the Holy Spirit as well. And there we are trying to explain how you can have three in one. You know, I picked up the bottle of water, and I says, well, there's water, but if you freeze it, it's ice. And if you apply some heat to it, it becomes water vapor. Three in one, that's the same substance. <laughs> I got that from Mike, by the way, from Kids Church. <laughs> And I was we're trying to explain how a one-dimensional creature, you know, one dimension, say length, yeah? And you try to convince a one-dimensional creature that there's not just length, but there's breadth. And, 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 and two-dimensional creature saying, but, but man, there, there, there's, there's more than length, man. There's breadth. And the, and, and the, the one-dimensional creature is going, what? How can there be more than two dimensions? How, how can there be, sorry, more than one dimension? What do you mean by breadth? I can't get my head around that. But then a three-dimensional creature with length and breadth and height, height? The two-dimensional person says, height? What do you mean height? There's only length and there's breadth. That's all there is. <laughs> but the three-dimensional creature, you know, he draws a cube. But the second-dimensional creature can't get his head around that. So our, our friend was listening to this explanation. And I said, but what if a fourth-dimensional creature came? And said that in that world that one can be three. What would you say? You'd probably say what the other preacher said. I can't get my head around that. <laughs> and that's why we believe us. We simply believe it. We might not understand it. The Trinity to me is, the Trinity to me is still a mystery. Because you're talking about eternal things. You're speaking about spiritual things. Amen. That somehow in eternity, somehow in the world, in the realm of the spirit, God is a person, three persons in one. And we just have to accept that. Amen. Oh, we just never move beyond where we are, like the one dimension, two dimensional, three dimensional creature. Are you with me? So let's, let's just believe the word of God and, and let's thank God that Christianity is as it is. It's like, wow, thank God there is some stuff you can't get your head around. Because so many religions, it's just, they simply make a God in their own image. They, they, it's just, yeah, it's just like, yeah, just like a reflection of man. But friend, Christianity, it's like, wow, you, do, you look at some of the stuff I'm about to read to you. You get your head around some of it, but boy, some of it challenges even the greatest theologians. Amen. Simply because we're creatures in this world, a three-dimensional world, a world of time and space, where through the senses you relate to this world. But friend, Jesus says you need to be born again. You want to understand my kingdom. You want to understand the realm of the spirit. You want to follow me. You've got to be born again. This time spiritually. And then you're born. That's what it, that's what it means to be a born again Christian. There's, there's something else God does on the inside. A recreation of your human spirit that you can relate to him. Somebody nod their head at least. I hope I'm not boring you. I began to pray, I began to, I began to prepare this, and a little thought came. It wasn't from my head. It says, oh, they'll just be bored with it. So why let, let's uh, let's go on. Why is Jesus 
referred to in that passage as the Word, capital W. Why is he referred to as the Word? Well, think about what a Word is. A Word is like a, a it contains a thought, isn't it? it? It gives form to a thought. I'm giving, I'm speaking words to you to try and give you a communication about God. Mm -hmm. To communicate God to you. So when we speak, when we give words, they are like thought containers. They're concept containers. Amen? So this is a poor explanation, but it's, it's all, I've, all I've got at this, this time. So Jesus is called the Word because he communicates 100% who God is to human beings. He's, he's the Word that proceeds from the Father and, and shows the world who he is, what God is like. So much so, guys... So much so that when Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father, what did Jesus say? He says, have you been with me all this time, Philip? And you're asking me to show you the Father? Do you remember what he said? He says, if you've seen me, Jesus speaking, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he is the word of God. He is, he is that which communicates. Amen. And just to, go to, the, just to give you a second um, of those passages, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. These are great places. If you... If, Great scriptures. If you have someone in the same well as Jesus, God, you know, what do you, Christ this, this is where you go. John chapter 1, although that won't help you with a Jehovah's Witness because they changed it. It's an appalling translation, their Bible. Anyway, I won't get into that. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways, dreams, visions, the prophets, he spoke in time past, so previous to Christ coming. He spoke in time past to the fathers, the old patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and all the people since then. He spoke, David and Solomon, he spoke to the fathers by the prophets. So God, like Isaiah, whom we've read before, God spoke through them. But he has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Okay? Whom he has appointed heir of all things. Now look at this. Through whom also he made the worlds. Now what, what did they know about the worlds back then? They saw the stars. They saw the constellations. They, they were aware of the wandering planets. And so they, they knew that the cosmos, that God had created that. Through him also he made the worlds who being in the brightness of his glory, this is Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, and look at this, the express image of his person. So Jesus is the express image of the person of God the Father. Are you with me? That's why he could say, if you've seen me, guys, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's a perfect representation of the Father. And look at this, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Notice it doesn't say the power of his word. And upholding all things by the word of his power, that creative word. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow! You start to get an inkling of who this man is. That he pre-existed. That he only became the man Jesus, when he was born. But before that, this person, the Word, who'd become flesh, he pre-existed all the way back before time. This is who we're dealing with. Are you with me? This is just basic theology. If you go to seminary, you will run into the, the doctrine of the deity of Christ pretty promptly. So, I also want to show you Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 to 18. Let's go there. And uh, we're reading from the King James Version or the New King James Version. Colossians chapter 1. It's good to take notes on this because 
you're going to find yourself, the key belief, the key belief that Christians believe is in the deity of Christ. So if, if you've got any heart at all to evangelize, you need to be able to unpack this. You need to know the go-to passages to sit down with someone to explain who you believe in. You've got to get past his humanity. Amen. You've got to show them that he's God. Are you with me? So in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through to 18, it says, He, so Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, speaking of His, his, his resurrection and ascension. For by Him all things were created. Everybody say all things. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things we created through him, and look at this, and for him. Did you catch that last word? What were you created for? For him. What's the meaning of life? Is it, is it just like eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow, tomorrow we die? Or is it more agnostic, more atheistic? No, the Bible tells us why. It answers those massive philosophical questions. Is there a reason to life? Is there meaning to life? Why am I here? Who am I? Am I for anything? Yeah, you're for God. And the good news is, He's for you. <laughs> he is for you, man. And if you don't know Him, He's after you. <laughs> Very gently. Very gently drawing. You might say, how do I know that? Well, you're here in church, aren't you? How did that happen? I used to sit there in the first few, the first few weeks in church, and I thought, how did I get here? How did me, a pagan, dope-smoking, alcohol, women-chasing pagan, how did I end up in church that morning? A lot of prayer. A lot of prayer from my gran, my aunties, my mother, and if you've got that kind of mother, then you've got that kind of grandma. Guess what? God won't let up in you. He will just keep coming. And my advice to you is just quit rebelling and give in. <laughs> Amen. And get a real life. Get a life. A real life. The life you're meant to have. Okay. Genesis 1.26, so we're going right back to creation, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. And I love this. Genesis 1.26, New King James Version. Then God said, now listen, listen, listen. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. It doesn't say, let me make man in my image. It says, let us make Make God in our image. So there's at least two people talking. Mm -hmm. It's the plural. And what we have here is God the Father speaking to God the Son. At the very least, amen. Probably the Holy Spirit is included in that as well. It's a conversation between the Godhead. But it most certainly involves God the Father speaking to God the Son and saying, let's make man in our image. Wow! And then the incredible thing is, that being, the Son of God, who created the first man, thousands of years later, after that man fell and dropped us all in it, and we're all imperfect, and we're all sinning, and we're all causing pain to ourselves and pain to everybody else, because of that man's decision to go independent of God. But God loved the world so much. At the appropriate time, he gave his only begotten son. And unto us a son was born. Amen. Unto us a son was born. A child was born. A son was given. And then further to that, that son of God died on that cross because he loved us so very much. And he didn't want to send any one of us to hell. And he took the judgment for all our sin. And he died himself in our place. 
But the good news is God raised him from the dead. Wow. God raised him from the dead and he sat down at the right hand of Father. But believe me, because he's God, he's also a judge. He's a loving savior. But the reason he went to the cross is because he doesn't want to judge anybody and send them to hell. That's why he took the sins of the whole world on himself. But one day, if we have not believed in him, if we, if we haven't somehow had the revelation of him and done something about it and given our life back to him, then one day when we die, he will have to judge us. And he, he will probably say, I carried your sin on the cross. I, I, paid the, I paid the price for your sin, but you decided to keep going. And now I have to judge you. And you'll have to be eternally separated from me. Do you hear what I'm saying? Just bear with me for as I rattle off these last few scriptures. One of the things that really helped me was to study the scriptures that speak of Jesus. And it's usually Jesus speaking that show that he was conscious while on earth, he was conscious that he existed before he was incarnated. Yep. And I'm going to give you quite a few scriptures. Are you up for this? So here we join two scriptures and we draw them from that incredible moment where somebody, probably John, is listening in to Jesus praying to his father at the end of his ministry. John 17, we call it the great high priestly prayer of Jesus. Then it's really sacred ground, and John hears it. And he hears Jesus pray to the Father, and he says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Wow. That makes the hair go up in the back of my neck reading this stuff. John 17, 24. Father, same prayer, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, the disciples, may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Before it. And John 3.13, get your head around this one, a lot of theologians can't. John 3.13, the same chapter about being born again. Jesus says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Mm -hmm. So he knew that he had come down from heaven. But look at the rest of this verse, and I'm just going to leave it with you. I'm, just going to, I'm not going to make you lazy. You can dig this out for yourself on Bible Hub or Bible Gateway. Check the commentaries out. But this has bamboozled a lot of theologians. Not all of them, thank goodness. But let's read the whole thing. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. You catch that? The Son of Man who is in heaven, which implies a couple of things, which I'll let you unpack. And if you're really interested, send me a text. Most people go home and have lunch and forget it. Look at this one. John 6, 51. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, a sacrifice, which I shall give for the life of the world. Look at this one. John 6, 62. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? He was aware of this. And then John 8, 53, pardon me, the 58. I love this one. The Jews were very antagonistic towards him, and he's in a, quite a heated conversation here with them. And they say to him, Are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? <laughs> Here's God standing in front of him. <laughs> God standing right in front of him, like, like right here. And they're saying to him, Who do you make yourself out to be? I think, that, Oh, dear me. Just incredible. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, well, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But it's my father who honors me, of whom you say that he's your God. 
Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I'll be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it by faith and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Look at Jesus' reply. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. (laughs) How far before Abraham? I mean, how far back's that? A couple of thousand years almost. Before Abraham was, I am. He he was aware of who he was. He was aware of this pre-existence. Not just in the days of Abraham, but before the foundation. This is the kind of man. This is who we believe in, guys. If if the Holy Spirit really reveals this to you, as he did to me in that moment where he's called mighty God, this will change your life. It will put Jesus just where he needs to be. And your attitude towards him will just be reverential. So what kind of man is this? One last scripture. Can you handle one more scripture? 1 John 5.20. Let's read this one. 1 John 5.20. Last scripture. We'll close with this. And we have seen and know positively that the Son of God has actually come to this world and has given us understanding and insight progressively to perceive and recognize and come to know better and more clearly Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This man is the true God and life eternal. It doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? This man, apparently a man, he's God, and also in Him eternal life. Amen. In John 19, there's a definition given of what eternal life is. And Jesus said eternal life is to know him, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. It's about a relationship. Christianity is about a relationship. Where you're brought into right relationship through him forgiving us of our sin, which has caused a wrong relationship. But if we put our trust in him, he forgives us, he cleanses us, and he puts his righteousness upon us. His. Not our fig leaf kind of good works and be a good person. He just says, there's nobody good enough here, but my righteousness I'm going to give to you. Just accept it. Free gift of God. Amen. Let's give God a big clap. Come on. Let's stand up and give him a big clap. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. The wonder of it all, Lord. The wonder of it all. Oh, the wonder of it all. We're just amazed, Jesus. Yes, we glorify you. We glorify you. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Father God. We know who he is. And and, and, and wonder of wonders, he lives in us by the Holy Spirit. Oh, the wonder of Christianity, the wonder of being born again, of knowing you're a child of God, that your eternity is settled. Well, friend, if you've come to this church building this morning and you're still making up your mind, or maybe it's the first you've heard of it, (laughs) or just keep walking, just keep studying, just keep asking questions, and we'll keep praying, and uh, you will find yourself coming into a relationship with God. Amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And uh